Hi, we're going to talk about morphology, the part of linguistics that studies the parts of the words. So there are many words that are just a single part, where it's a single element that has one meaning. For example, the word tree just means the living being in the forest. And if you split the word tree, it would cease to mean anything. If you take tr and e, for example, none of those things, neither of those things mean tree, and now the meaning is lost. Likewise, if you take a word like house, the place where you live, and split it in how and s, neither of these parts means house. You will have lost the meaning. So tree and house are a single element with a single meaning. But there are many words that can be split into different parts. So, for example, the word pets. In the word pets, it's uh, kind of intuitive that there are two units. There's pet, which is the um, animal that accompanies you, and s, which means that there's more than one of this animal. So there's like a core meaning, pet, and then s, which is like a grammatical addition to it. In the word weights, like they like the person waits you have wait which is the action the main meaning and then s, which in this case means that he she they are waiting in the word taller for example you have a core meaning which is to be tall and then the er which means that someone is this taller than someone else so Words like pets, weights, and taller can have more than one part in them, and they have they gain full meaning when they are joined together. But you can split them, and the parts will still have meanings of their own. Each of these parts that has a meaning of their own is a minimal unit of meaning, and we call these morphemes. So you can have morphemes like weight, tall, uh, house, tree, that have um, full meanings, and you can have other morphemes that are, add grammatical meaning to the words. In English, for example, the morpheme s in weights means that it's a third person. The morpheme ed in waited means that the action of waiting was done in the past. And the morpheme ing in waiting means that the action is done progressively, continuously. As you can see, nouns have uh, can also be compounded with other morphemes like the plural s, and adjectives can be compounded with things like er, tall, taller. So you can have one word with one or more morphemes. Tree is a word with one morpheme, tree, and trees is a word with two morphemes, tree, s. You um. And, indeed, we have two main types of morphemes. The roots, which are the core meaning, like tree, uh, and the affixes, which add grammatical meanings, such as the s in trees, in weights, the ing in waiting, which adds a little bit of grammatical meaning to the word. Um, there are different types of affixes. So... Um, English has a kind of affix called the suffix. These are affixes that go after the root. So you have a root like wait, which is the action of waiting, and then you add s after the root, or ing, waits, waiting, waited. You have the root and then the suffix. This is the right way to connect the affixes in English. You cannot have a word in English like in wait where the ing would precede the root. You need to have the, um, the a-i-n-g after the root. Spanish, French, German, many languages that you might be familiar with also use suffixes where you have the root and then the affixes come after the root. In some languages like Turkish, you can have more than one suffix after the root. So in the Turkish word, and pardon my Turkish, we got a last behaving as if you were amongst those whom we could not civilize. And yes, that is one word. You have a root, uygar, and then 
Plastic Ama de Glash Emes Dan Mesinis Jazina. Several suffixes that go after the root. So English, Spanish, French, uh, German, Turkish, their affixes go after the root. They are suffixes. There's many languages where the grammatical affixes actually go before the root. They're called prefixes. Uh, Swahili is one such language. So for example, we have roots like soma to read. And we have words. These are just one word. Nina soma. Another word. Nili soma. And another word, nita soma. I am reading, I was reading, and I will read. In all of these, the root, soma, is what comes at the end of the word. And at the beginning of the word, what we have is the prefix ni, which means that I am doing the reading. Uh, there's another prefix in, uh, before the root, which is na, li, or ta, which is the uh, conjugation. So one of them is the present tense, I am reading, I was reading, I will read. Notice that in English, we do the past with a, a suffix. So, um, I waited. In Swahili, you do the past with a prefix. So, we have uh, roots that have the core meaning of the word, prefixes, and suffixes. There's other types of affixes that you might find. English has a kind called an infix. In an infix, you take a root and you break it in, in half and then put the affix right in the middle. Uh, for example, in fan freaking tastic, you have a root like fantastic, then you break it because fan and task fantastic is not made of a fan and tastic. Fantastic is really just one unit, but you split it in two and insert freaking right in the middle. There's other words in English that can do this as well. Fan bloody tastic, for example. There's something called a circumfix in other languages. English doesn't have these. But in Arabic, for example, when you want to say no in a verb, like I didn't write, you need to say ma, the root, and then sh, maktab, sh, I didn't write. And so the affix has two parts around the root. In reduplication, you have the root and you do it twice. So rumah rumah is Pahasa Indonesia for houses. And it comes from the root rumah, which is just one house. So we have uh, affixes, which add grammatical meaning, and roots, which are the core meaning. But all the roots that we've looked at so far are kind of strung together. So if you have walk, the sounds walk are all bundled up together. There's languages where the roots are discontinuous, where the roots uh, are have their letters separated, their sounds separated, and then the conjugation is a kind of interleaving of other sounds in the middle of the roots. For example, in the first, uh, these are words in Arabic. The first row has darasa, madrasa, adrus. He studied, school, and I study. So all of these forms have in common the consonants D, R, S. And then the conjugation of the root DRS is an interleaving of a pattern between the consonants. So the past for the third person masculine, he studied, is the first consonant, the letter, the, the sound A, the second consonant, the sound A, the third consonant, and the sound A. Darasa. To say that there's a place where you study, you have the sounds MA, then the first consonant, the second consonant, then either an A or an E, depending on the root, the third consonant, and then an A. Madrasa. Finally, for the present first person singular, so I study, you have the sound A, the consonant 1, a D, the consonant 2, the R, either an I or an U, depending on the root, in this case U, and the consonant 3, which is S. Adrus. So, adrus. In the interweaving of the root and the pattern, you make the conjugation of verbs in Arabic, which is very different from how we conjugate verbs in English. You can see this in other roots. For example, KTB is to write. Kataba, maktab, aktub, he wrote, dusk, and I write. 
In summary, morphemes are minimal units of meaning. You can have one word with multiple morphemes, each of them adding some gradation of meaning to the word. There's roots that have the core meaning, and then there's affixes, which add some grammatical meaning. The affixes can be before the root, we call those prefixes. They can come after the root, we call those suffixes. And there's other types as well, such as infixes, circumfixes, and reduplications. Some roots, like those in English, Spanish, French, German, Japanese, are continuous. And some roots are not, like those in Arabic. This is optional, but just in case you're wondering. One of the operations we're going to be doing is called stemming. And so far, we've only been talking about roots. In English, we will assume that roots and stems are roughly the same thing. Uh, but in other languages, they're slightly different. So the root is the one that has the core meaning of the verb, and the stem is the core meaning plus the conjugational type or category. So if you've studied a language, language like Spanish, uh, French, Japanese, you'll remember that in order to conjugate a verb, you have to learn the verb itself and then the conjugation category, like how do I conjugate this like an ER verb, like an AR verb, and so forth. In Spanish, comer, to eat, is conjugated differently from parar, to stop, because one ends in ER and one in, ends in AR. So the root is just the initial segments, C-O-M, P-A-R, which are the ones that have the meaning, and then the stem is the following, is the root, plus the following vowel, come, para. Once we have the stem unit, we can conjugate the verb for all of its alternatives. So, comemos, we eat, versus paramos, we stop. So, in other languages, there are differences between a root and a stem, but in English, we will assume that roots and stems are the same thing. In uh, videos further down the week, we will look at how stemming can help us with our searches along texts. Thank you.